Good morning. Thank you for coming to our seminar. I'm delighted to be here in Athens and Greece for the first time in my life and look very much looking forward. Well, I can look right outside. I don't have to look forward. I can see nice things right from here. Uh, we've got a one pointer already. Not a big dot, but there we go. So thank you for coming. How many of you are neonatologists? Is there anybody else here? <laughs> A gastroenterologist, good. How many of you feed your preterm babies four grams per kilo per day of amino acids starting on day one? Good. Then uh, doc Dr. New, Dr. Bell, Dr. Martin and myself have some interesting things to talk to you about. Uh, throughout the next several hour, uh, hours and days of lectures, we will uh, overlap a lot. This is not meant to suggest that you're not smart enough that if we don't say it the first time, you have to hear it three or four times. Uh, we will talk very rapidly. We speak in uh, English. Sometimes we say things that we think we understand but really don't and can't imagine how anyone else could understand them. Uh, and some of these topics really bear going over and over again. So within my four talks, you will hear a great deal of overlap. I hope by the end of it, you'll actually have uh, come to grips with some of the things that I'll be talking about, and there'll be overlap among the talks. So don't worry if you miss something. You don't have to write every note down. We'll come back to these things. At the bottom of this slide right here, you, you see that my email address. Uh, if you don't have a chance to ask a question of me personally, please write down my email address and send me an email. One of the fun things that the faculty at Hippocrates Seminars uh, enjoys is to hear from people uh, days, weeks, months, years after our programs, and we really do make good connections. Sometimes these are just social, but other times they're around business issues. Uh, very frequently, someone comes up to me and says, can you please send me your talk or uh, a reference paper or even come to my program because, you know, the professor doesn't believe what you said, and I really can't uh, change anything in my program until you come convince the professor that um, uh, we should do things differently. So we've, we've heard this before. So I'm going to talk to you first about uh, a model, the fetal model for what we ought to be feeding our babies. And I use the word ought because I don't think there's a better model for how we should start nutri conceiving of nutrition and actually providing nutrition than to think about what the fetus needs at the same gestational age. In order to grow at that gestational age in utero, the fetus needs certain amounts of nutrients given at certain rates. And uh, we'll talk about how we might get to that using the fetal model. Um, if we're trying to achieve postnatal growth rates, approximating those of the preterm baby, uh, who is a, still a fetus, um, which is a reasonable goal, if not maybe the, the, the most scientifically justified goal, how are we doing? And the answer is we're really not doing all that well. Uh, these are data from the uh, neonatal and, uh, research network from the National Institutes of Health, the, the, the very fine lines, showing that after birth, most preterm infants do not grow for a long time. When they do start growing, their growth rates are slower. These are in utero growth curves uh, from ultrasound data from the University of Iowa. Babies who are born preterm tend to be on the smaller side, but by term, you can clearly see that almost all preterm babies, if not 100% of them, are growth restricted. So whether they start growth restricted as preterm infants or they all become growth restricted by the time they are at term. I've superimposed on these curves data from uh, 1948 to point out that over 60 years of working on improving the nutrition and the medical care of preterm babies really hasn't changed things a whole lot. Uh, these probably were not as sick a group of infants as we tend to take care of today, so maybe those growth rates are even a little better in 1948. But the point is, most babies don't grow after birth very well. And what's the major problem? Well, there are lots of problems with preterm babies that stress them, respiratory disease, gastrointestinal disease, and so forth. But the biggest problem that I see is that we simply don't feed babies. Here's data on uh, protein intake, and this is calorie, in, or this is calorie intake, and this is protein intake down here. Uh, 
This is customary nutrition. That's the curve at the top here. And that's an aggressive approach. And even with an aggressive approach, feeding babies more than we ordinarily do, feeding them at ra more rapid rates, we still see that there's a cumulative deficit over many days up for the, through the first month of life of protein and energy. So we really are not feeding our babies. There's no way you and I could grow if we still had a chance to grow if we didn't eat as much as our body needed to grow, and that's the case for babies. We simply are undernourishing them. Does it matter? Well, we think it does. Now, here's the timing of this is particularly critical. Here's a, a neonatal rat still in the weaning phase, and if you undernourish this neonatal rat, its growth rate slows, but importantly, notice that its long-term growth is limited completely. It cannot become a normal-sized adult. It's stunted in its size. Whereas this is more what you and I have to deal with. At this stage of our development, if we undernourish ourselves, we go on a diet, we lose weight, or we hopefully would lose weight. But then if we eat again, we gain it all right back, all too easily. So the developmental stage of when undernutrition happens is critical. For adults, it's not a big deal. We can get back to normal nutrition very easily and back to our normal body composition. But for a baby in a very sensitive stage of development, this is not so easy to do. So our goal is through research and medical practice to try to uh, come up with approaches to promote the uh, growth of a normal term baby uh, from this very preterm baby and avoid producing, producing this very severely restricted growth, res uh, growth restricted baby. What about nutritional programming? Uh, I'll come back to this in a separate talk, but Dr. New already went through this as a topic. Under nutrition at critical stages of development, which I've already pointed out to you, are occur during fetal and neonatal life can really affect a number of organs. Dr. Bell will be talking to you about what happens in babies when we don't feed their brains particularly well. Dr. New introduced this subject. These are just, just a short uh, note from Dr. Uh, Professor Smart at Cambridge University several years ago, where he noticed that if you undernourish rat, uh, fetal rats at particular developmental stages, you end up with smaller brains, not just smaller brains, but that's because there are fewer neurons this results in long-term outcomes that are not good. It's not just that your brains are smaller, it's that you cannot think and behave normally. So when we say that close to 100% of very preterm babies have some neurodevelopmental handicap, this is very likely one of the sources of that long-term outcome. Growth-restricted fetuses have long-term reductions in pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin. So they grow up without insulin, the capacity to produce as much insulin, and so not surprisingly, they become diabetic. Growth restriction produces less skeletal muscle. This is lifelong. After you're born, you cannot produce more muscle cells, just like you generally cannot produce more pancreatic beta cells or more brain cells. And so your muscle is the largest organ in the body that is insulin sensitive when you're an adult. And if you have less muscle, there's, more capacity, uh, there's less capacity for insulin to act to, to uh, produce, uh, to get rid of glucose into tissues. So you tend to develop diabetes sooner. So IUGR infants overall are predisposed to develop obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. Does nutrition matter? What, if I'm talking about whether this is a problem, could we just simply give more attrition and make a difference? And the answer is obviously Yes, but it wasn't obvious to many people. This study took uh, uh, almost uh, 30 years. This study was started in, 19, in the 1980s in wh where a group of, in Cambridge University in England fed different, uh, they studied babies that were fed at five different hospitals, and each one of those hospitals used a different nutritional regimen for preterm babies. There was one that only fed banked milk, one that fed mother's own milk, one that fed supplemented milk, one that fed routine pre, uh, newborn formula and one that fed premature formula from very dilute, thin, not very highly nourished, all the way up to very nourished, uh, very highly nourished uh, formulations. And the good news was that brain size at teenage years, so 15 to 20 years after those babies were preterm infants, 
if you now did a magnetic resonance image scan of their brains, the size of the brain correlated directly with the amount of nutrition that they got as preterm babies. And particularly within the brain, it wasn't just the overall size, but certain regions of the brain, show you here just the left caudate nucleus, and that left not caudate nucleus, as well as brain size and other part, critical parts of the brain, were directly associated with different aspects of intelligence. So there is both improvement or potential for improved growth if you better feed your babies, and it's not just growth, it's growth of the brain, and it's not just growth of the brain, it's the functional outcome of the brain, that the intelligence and the behavior that goes with it is better off if we feed babies more. Okay, so enough introduction. If we're going to feed babies like we ought to feed a, pre, uh, a fetus to grow a normal fetus, and we therefore would like to grow a normal ba uh, preterm baby, what are the nutrients and how much should we give? And I'll talk about the following five nutrients. Most of you don't think of oxygen as a nutrient, but you cannot metabolize glucose, lipids, or amino acids without oxygen. And insulin, of course, is not a nutrient, but it's one that we often think of as an important, perhaps one of the more fundamental growth hormones that has to be there for, to uh, allow all of these nutrients to be used for growth, not just for metabolism. So we'll start with oxygen. Here's an in vitro study. These are uh, liver cells that are grown in culture, and they're grown at different glucose concentrations. Um, these are uh, from an animal model, so don't worry about the actual value, but 12 and a half, 20 and 50 milligrams per deciliter. And the blue bar, the light blue bar is the basal condition, and then the dark blue bar, insulin was added. And you'll notice in this group of cells, very low oxygen concentration, there was essentially no change in the response to insulin or the response to glucose in the growth of those cells. So at very low oxygen environments, these cells could not do much of anything. They barely stayed alive. But now we raise the oxygen to what we call close to room air. And you can see that now um, from the basal period to the insulin stimulated period and at the very high glucose concentration uh, uh, condition, there's very nice cell growth. So very clearly, the uh, capacity for these cells to grow is dependent on oxygen. What does the normal uh, in vivo fetus do? Well, again, we, we don't have capacity to study this that well in humans, but we can take an animal model. These were sheep that were taken from uh, sea level to uh, 13,000 feet, so that's 4,000 or so meters, somewhere in that range. And as you can see, uh, this, the, uh, there are two groups, those that uh, uh, were at sea level and those were at altitude and two different gestational ages. This is comparable to around a 24 to 28 week preterm baby and that's close to term. Whether uh, the control group grew very nicely, but look, the group that was at altitude that was very hypoxic also had normal weights. And it, what happened that allowed them to grow at this very low oxygen environment at 13,000 feet. They increased their hematocrit by increase in their hemoglobin. They produced more red blood cells. So they maintained growth by increasing blood oxygen content. They did this through natural mechanisms of, of hypoxia stimulating erythropoiesis through production of erythropoietin and they have a larger number of red cells and therefore the capacity for oxygen to support growth. How does this apply to babies? Well, quite a few years ago, uh, Jim Stockman, Dr. Stockman is now the president of the American Board of Pediatrics. He did a nice investigation. He noticed that preterm infants didn't gain weight as well when their hemoglobins were less than eight and a half grams per deciliter. That's an hematocrit in the very low 20s. Weight gain improved after transfusions that got the hematocrit up, uh, the hemoglobin above 11.4. That's an hematocrit in the mid uh, 30s. So an observation, if you take the experimental studies in, the, in vitro in cell culture and the experimental model in the animal, you find that blood oxygen content, the amount of oxygen available is important for growth. And so if we allow our babies to get too anemic, we're going to limit their capacity for growth. And if you remember, amino acids for growth, it doesn't matter where those amino acids are in the body or what part of the body they're, uh, you're trying to get cell growth. 
that this only happens in the presence of oxygen. And that's going to apply to the brain as well as the uh, muscle and the bones. So here's a group of babies, a little older than our preterm infants, but it makes the point all the, all the more strongly. I don't know if you can see this group, but this is the uh, babies that were always on oxygen. And they were followed for uh, quite a few uh, months. They all were babies from our intensive care nursery who had chronic lung disease, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But their growth rates were really quite nice. They had a pretty straightforward increase. In contrast, here's a group of babies who uh, were started on oxygen when they went home, and they were growing, but for one reason or another, their parents did not give them oxygen. Um, could have been technical, it could have been financial, there was some reason why the babies didn't get oxygen at home. So when they came back to the clinic, they hadn't grown at all. And as soon as they came back to the clinic and the, this observation was made that they were off oxygen and not growing, they were put into a home nursing program. The nurse went to the home, ensured that oxygen was administered, and their growth rates now continued. And this overall growth rate on oxygen is the same as the babies that stayed on oxygen all the time. I think that's one of the nicer studies to show that once you're dependent on oxygen, and of course most of our preterm babies are, if without oxygen you don't grow. So our current practice is to allow extremely low birth weight babies to be more anemic, and there's rationale for this. We want to limit the risks of transfusion. Uh, we used to think of this as just uh, uh, antigen-antibody interactions, but there's transfusion-related inflammatory disorders, and these are more commonly recognized today as we, uh, as we look at these. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis related to uh, transfusions is becoming an increasingly important con problem. Strokes occur during uh, and following transfusions, and we could go on, but these are serious problems. So there's rationale for not transfusing babies as, you know, just every other day just to keep the hematocrit at a higher level. And we also don't want to uh, produce high oxygens because there's all kinds of oxygen toxicity, and we could spend a whole uh, Hippocrates seminar on oxygen toxicity. Um, Unfortunately, what we don't know is what's limiting our capacity to do more about this. We don't know how to measure the effect of low oxygen supply on energy metabolism and protein accretion. We can do that in an animal model or a cell model. We can't do it very well in babies, not in current uh, technology. And we don't know how to measure the effect of lower oxygen supply and nutrient metabolism on neuronal growth and development. Wouldn't that be nice? I could do this in the animal model but I don't think I could do this in a normal baby. So we don't know at what level of oxygen. Maybe we're trying to adjust the oxygen a little up or a little down for various reasons. We don't have the capacity to measure those minor changes in oxygen on, on the cell development. So we need a lot more research, and I'd hope some of you would take interest in this. We need to know how to optimize nutrient and anabolic hormones, like insulin, to promote growth, especially of the brain, we need to know more about erythropoietin and how to use it. Should we just give it more often? Should we give larger doses? Should we use develop safer transfusions? I think you could say we need some of all of this. Let's look next at glucose. If you take an animal model like the fetal sheep that I'm able to study in the laboratory, at mid-gestation, the glucose utilization rate is quite high per kilo of body weight, it falls to about half that value at term. So this is a value appropriate for a 20 to 24 week gestational age preterm baby. And in fact, when you look at glucose production rates in otherwise reasonably healthy preterm infants, not too different from that gestational age in the animal model, you see the same phenomenon, a fairly high glucose utilization rate falling to about half that value. Why does glucose utilization rate per kilo of body weight go down? That's because the body is primarily using glucose for brain metabolism, and very early in gestation, this is the large part of the body. As you get older as a preterm, as a fetus, you produce fat, which doesn't use very much glucose. You produce muscle, which at that gestational age is not using much glucose. You produce bone. You grow this intestinal tract. You start producing more skin. So you're diluting, if you will, the, the uh, utilization rate by putting into the body tissues that don't consume very much glucose. 
the brain is still using just as much glucose at this gestational age as it did at this gestational age. What glucose concentration should we use for nutrition? Not, I'll tell you more about glucose in my last talk, but if you look at what normal fetuses have for their glucose concentration, you see this is a data collected from umbilical uh, cord blood sampling uh, done at the uh, University of Milano in, uh, by Anna Maria Marconi and her colleagues. They did umbilical vein sampling, and uh, you can see that uh, over the second half of gestation, Almost all of the, neonate, of the fetal, normal fetal glucose concentrations were above 3 millimolar. That's about a little over 50 milligrams per deciliter. Most of them were higher than that, but that's a lower limit. So I guess I would say that if that's the case over the second half of gestation, we really should aim to keep for growth purposes, for normal growth purposes, the glucose concentration above 50 milligrams per deciliter or 3 millimolar. That doesn't talk about the issue of transient hypoglycemia, which I'll get to later, which is a totally separate issue. It's just that over the second half of gestation, that's the kind of glucose values that babies have. Glucose is transferred into cells by concentration de dependent mechanisms. So keeping that glucose at that level most of the time is going to provide cells, particularly those in the brain, with sufficient glucose for metabolism and for growth. Once the baby's born, you can see the glucose tends to drop, and then it comes back up. So the first hour or so of life, glucose concentrations are generally a little bit above 30. Then they're, uh, after several hours of life, they tend to go up above 45. And once the baby's well-established and is a normal baby and doing quite well, the glucose concentrations tend to be above 55 to 60. So the normal postnatal term infant and late preterm infant produce just what I said happens in the fetus. The glucose concentrations tend to be above 50 milligrams per deciliter. So I think this is, if we're going to talk about a preterm baby, these are good values to use. What happens if you can't do this? We, we, well, nobody's going to go out and do this experiment. You're not going to deprive one group of babies of glucose, keep their concentrations low, or allow them repeated hypoglycemia. But uh, Dr. Alan Lucas and his colleagues at Cambridge quite a few years ago now did do a, a retrospective study. Uh, these were the same babies that were in that nutrition study that I spoke of. And every day, one of those, ba those babies in that study got a glucose measurement at 8 o'clock in the morning. And when they looked at their data retrospectively, they noticed that as there were more low glucoses in a given baby, the intellectual and motor developmental scores were lower. This suggested that the more often a baby's glucose concentration was less than that magic value of around 50 milligrams per deciliter, there were more complications in terms of neurological outcomes. So perhaps there was a relationship to nutrition, particularly with glucose, that, uh, and the uh, ultimate outcome of neurological development. Well, that's a retrospective study. It could have been these babies were just not normal to begin with and couldn't regulate glucose. But it is, uh, if, you'll, uh, uh, if you will, food for thought to think that maybe keeping glucose in a normal range is of some value. That's obviously not the whole story because um, nature doesn't just deal with deficiencies and let them go. Uh, nature always tries to respond with some kind of adaptation. Uh, I just show you this animal experiment. These, uh, uh, I think, are rats. Um, each bar represents, each pair of bars represents a different brain region. And the uh, unshaded bars on the left of each of the pairs represents the glucose utilization rate in that brain region with acute low glucose concentrations. They lowered the glucose by 50 percent, and that's the kind of response that you got in all of these different great regions of the brain. But if you kept the glucose concentration low for longer periods, not just an hour or so, Look what happened. Almost all of the brain regions showed an increase, almost back to normal, of brain glucose utilization. So there was clearly an upregulation, an adaptation, positively trying to correct that low glucose or that glucose deficiency. And we can see the same thing in an experimental animal model that I study, the fetal sheep. These were long-term hypoglycemic models, and you can see that glucose transporters tended to either be norm, uh, normal or higher than normal. The glucose transporters are those molecules in the cell membranes 
that either in response to insulin or just because glucose is present, transport glucose from the extracellular fluids into the cells for metabolism. So response during to long-term hypoglycemia in the fetus is exactly the same as it occurs in that uh, uh, older rat model. The fetus, and therefore we would assume the preterm baby, have the capacity to respond to repeated low glucose concentrations with an upregulation and the capacity to take up glucose. Um, that's GLUT1 in fetal skeletal muscle despite very low glucose concentrations in these growth-restricted fetuses, fairly well maintained. Same for uh, GLUT4, the insulin-sensitive transporter in skeletal muscle. Um, the insulin receptor is actually increased in some of these, in, in the tissues that are insulin-responsive <coughs> when there is chronic low glucose concentration. So as a result, if you look at growth-restricted fetuses, sorry, that arrow should be over here, uh, you'll find that the glucose utilization rate is per kilo of body weight is normal despite long-term reductions in glucose concentration and insulin concentration. So there is capacity for upregulation to take place. And I'll come back to this as a programming issue when, uh, in another talk. So with chronic hypoglycemia, there's possibly, as Dr. Lucas's study showed you, the capacity for less neuronal development. But there's also the possibility of, of adaptation with upregulation of the capacity to take cell, uh, glucose from the plasma extracellular fluid mm -hmm. into cells. We don't measure any of these activities in the normal preterm baby. So I show you what can happen, and I think it's much smarter to simply say if you need a certain glucose concentration and a glucose utilization rate, that should be our goal. What about lipids? Well, humans are unique among all mammals in having a large amount of body fat. That's among land mammals, that is. A, a large amount of body fat, between 15 and 20 percent um, of body content as fat when they're born at term. Um, most of the animals that we study in the laboratory don't have much fat when they're born at all, 1 to 3 percent. Uh, the sheep that I study, 3 percent. If you take uh, rabbits and guinea pigs and you feed them very feed the, the pregnant dams very enriched chow, lots of energy, they can actually produce a fair amount of fat, but still considerably less than the human. So this appears to be a unique human development. We don't know why we have this issue. Why are normal human fetuses gaining fat late in gestation? And why are they born with this much body fat? We just don't know. This shows you lean mass, so don't forget, the major part of growth, even in late gestation, when we're talking about the increase in fat, is lean mass, bone and muscle and all of the cell membranes and all of our organs. That all requires protein. But fat is still a significant increase, and it happens in late gestation. What should we pay attention to? That's the gain in fat that I just talked about. But the story about fat is much more uh, complex than that. Consider the maternal plasma. The mother eats a diet that's highly variable around not just a given mother at any time during gestation, but around the world. Human diets are incredibly variable. So that at any one time, there's a large variation in all of the different lipids that occur in the maternal plasma. The placenta is a very active metabolic organ with respect to transport of some fats straight across the placenta, and in the other case, the metabolism of these fats to different fat, fatty acid molecules. So that not just is there a lot of uh, variability in maternal plasma fatty, fat, con uh, fat products, but the plasma concentrations of these fat products in the fetus is even more variable and we simply don't know what they are. There have been cordocentesis, umbilical blood vein sampling studies of glucose. I just showed you those. Amino acids have been studied, but there are practically no studies out there of taking, lipid, taking uh, uh, fetal blood and sampling it and analyzing it for fat concentrations. So some of these are maybe particularly important. Keto acids, important for oxidation in the brain, the liver, and the muscle. Glycerol produces triglyceride synthesis provides a source of gluconeogenesis. 
But the essential fatty acids are particularly important for membrane growth, and those membranes include those surrounding neurons. And you cannot grow normal neurons without a normal amount of these particular uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, how are we doing with feeding babies these important polyunsaturated fatty acids? Well, we don't do that well. So if you give intravenous standard intravenous lipid at at least 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo per day, there's plenty of fatty acids in there for normal development at least and normal metabolism. Um, most of the products we have available in the United States are more uh, enriched in omega-6 than the important omega-3 uh, fatty acid, polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the docosahexaenoic acids. But if you look at fetal white adipose tissue accumulation during the third trimester, the omega-3 accretion, let's just say it's approximately 60 to 70 milligrams uh, per, kilo, per day. If you take a normal preterm baby and feed that baby normal, mature human milk, which has just under four grams of fat per deciliter, and this fraction of fatty acids as the omega-3 fatty acids, then if you feed a one kilogram baby full enteral feeds of 180 mils per kilo per day, that's a very uh, hefty amount of food for a baby, you still only could produce about this much of this omega-3 fatty acid. So really only about a third of the uh, requirement of, uh, as, of 60 to 70 uh, milligrams per day. So we aren't doing very well. Does it matter? Uh, preterm infants uh, fed docosahexaenoic acid specifically in several research studies are beginning to show some important outcomes. Higher visual acuity, particularly at early developmental ages when eye contact, eye motor contact are very important for uh, uh, behavioral development. And improved scores on just about any kind of developmental uh, test that you could provide. So the current diet for our preterm babies is usually a su insufficient in the, this particular polyunsaturated fatty acid. And we don't know the significance of this over a lifespan, and nor, nor do we know what will happen if we feed these babies more. We think this might make a better difference early in life. Whether it improves long-term development, we don't know. Um, there are studies of trying to supplement mothers with docosahexaenoic acid um, to look whether it produces neuro neurocognitive outcomes in the offspring. Here's one particular study. Uh, they used uh, DHA-rich fish oil capsules and compared them to a uh, vegetable oil capsule, and they did not see any change in uh, cognitive or language development in the offspring during early childhood. So uh, it seems like a fairly straightforward story. We ought to be able to feed mothers more, and we ought to be, be able to feed babies more of these particular polyunsaturated fatty acids, but the long-term outcomes are still uncertain. What about amino acids? I've already pointed out that you need a lot of amino acids to grow. Very early in fetal life, uh, this is uh, studies, again, in the fetal sheep model where we can do these sorts of experiments. That's comparable to 24 to 36 weeks, or 24 to 30 weeks, this period to 30 to 36 weeks, and this period close to term. So fetal age, and as the fetus uh, gets younger and younger, meaning it hasn't grown very much, its metabolic turnover rate, and particularly its fractional protein synthetic rate, are very high. And the fractional growth rate is also very high. That diminishes, both of those uh, rates diminish over gestation so that by term they're much lower. But the fractional protein synthesis rate at term gestation and the fractional growth rate at term gestation are much higher than later in life. This is still the most rapid period of growth and the one that requires the highest amount of amino acids to support that growth per kilo of body weight. So at 24 to 36 weeks, this particular experiment in a fetal sheep showed that you needed 3.6 to 4.8 grams per kilo per day. You only needed about two to three at this gestation and one and a half to two at term gestation. At this gestation, which is the very small group babies that were taking care of in the neonatal intensive care unit, 
Dr. Eckhart Ziegler at the University of Iowa predicted from different approaches studying the composition of humans and the human fetal growth rate exactly the same requirement. Somewhere around four grams per kilo per day of amino acids is necessary to support this fractional growth rate and this fractional protein synthetic rate. So it's not surprising that if you take a group of preterm babies and feed them different amounts of amino acids, you see a very direct correlation between protein balance that you want to achieve and the amino acid intake provided. And when you see such a tight correlation, the data don't vary much around that mean growth rate uh, of, of protein balance. That's the kind of curve you see, that kind of data that you see when you're correcting a deficiency. When you have a deficiency state and you give some of that deficient material back, you have a very tight response between the, uh, what you are trying to achieve and what you're giving. So very clearly, at least up through three grams per kilo per day, there's a direct association, direct relationship between protein balance and therefore the capacity to grow and the protein intake provided. What about insulin? If you take, so what does insulin do in the fetus? People talk about insulin being a potent anabolic growth hormone. These are studies, again, in fetal sheep model. My colleague Abigail Foden at the University of Cambridge did these studies. At this gestational age, she took out the pancreas, surgically removed the pancreas. So the insulin concentration in that fetus was zero, no insulin at all. That's the normal growth rate. Without any insulin, growth rate slowed dramatically, but notice it's still positive. So you do benefit from insulin in, in producing growth, but insulin is not absolutely required. Then she did a nice study on top of this with another group of uh, fetuses that had their pancreas removed, and she gave, that's the, the variation around this curve, she gave back physiological doses of insulin, and look what she did. Giving back physiological doses of insulin and producing normal plasma insulin concentrations in those fetuses, she achieved normal rates of growth. There's the normal growth curve, and that's the, curve that got the group that got the insulin added back. Here she gave a different dose. This is pharmacologic insulin. And maybe there's a slight more increase in growth rate with pharmacological levels of insulin right away. I suspect that's due to the water and salt balance. Uh, maybe that's increasing the growth a little bit. But really over time, whether she gave physiological insulin or pharmacological insulin, she got the same normal rate of growth. So yes, you have to have insulin to grow normally, but you don't need insulin to continue to grow. But if you give back more than enough insulin, you don't grow more. So there are limitations to giving an anabolic hormone in terms of growth. Growth has its own trajectory. It's based on the amount of nutrients that are provided. Trying to stimulate that growth with a growth hormone does not produce more growth. So in preterm infants, there still is no evidence that giving insulin, as many people have tried to do, to enhance nutrition is beneficial and there are many problems and I'll refer you to the New England Journal of Medicine article regarding the European Nurture Study where they gave insulin to try to treat hyperglycemia or to prevent hyperglycemia but they kept the insulin uh, infusions going for long periods and while they saw no improvement in growth they saw lots of metabolic complications. So for the most part insulin treatment to increase growth in babies is not going to increase growth except that it will produce more fat in certain organs, particularly the heart and the liver. Fatty infiltration of the heart and liver are pathological processes. We should not try to do that. So I do not think you should be giving insulin to babies to promote growth. What about, I, I started off the talk, I pointed out on that one figure that many babies who are born preterm are already growth restricted and they become growth restricted from undernutrition. So in the nursery, we are generally dealing with growth restriction. So what about the growth restricted baby, the one that's born that way and the ones that get that way? Uh, I remind you again of the data that I've already showed that with growth restriction, there's a maintenance or an upregulation of the capacity of certain tissues to take up glucose. 
So we can maintain normal glucose utilization rates despite low glucose and insulin concentrations. At the same time, there's a downregulation in the capacity to produce more cells and to produce more uh, growth of cells. So this particular protein in that particular growth pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, is cut by 50% in these growth-restricted fetuses in this study. And you see the same thing in growth-restricted neonates in animal models. We haven't done these studies in babies for obvious reasons. This particular protein is in the insulin amino acid signal transduction pathway that actually, actually it takes amino acids and produces uh, protein uh, uh, synthesis. And that's the final protein in the pathway, and that's its binding protein. Reduced entry in, of amino acids from, and insulin in prom promoting the, uh, the uh, uh, synthesis of amino acids into protein, reduced final common protein in the pathway, and a double jeopardy, a double jeopardy the increase in the binding protein. So there's a reduction in the capacity to produce more cells. You can't have, you reduce hyperplasia capacity and a reduction in the capacity of those cells to take protein, amino acids and synthesize them into protein. So the IUGR phenotype results in, uh, will, in uh, includes, and I will talk about this later, the uh, decreased pancreatic development and insulin secretion capacity, but for our purposes right now, a de an increased capacity for glucose uptake, but a decreased capacity for cell growth, both division and uh, actual growth. Can we do anything about this? Well, we have a set of experiments going on in our laboratory in the fetal animal model where we produce growth restriction to see if we could, in fact, take an already growth restricted fetus and, re and get it to grow better. And I think we're trying to do this with the understanding that if we have a growth-restricted baby, we might be able to use the same nutritional techniques to get that growth-restricted baby, either one born that way or one that gets that way from undernutrition, to grow better again. These are some of the proteins in those protein synthetic pathways that I talked about. These are normal control fetuses. These are growth-restricted fetuses. Not a whole lot of response in the growth-restricted group compared to the control group. So if we, in fact, just give amino acids, give more of what I said you have to have to grow to the growth-restricted fetus, the one that's already growth-restricted and adapted, all of those mechanisms that I showed you that restrict cell growth are in play, and they don't allow these particular uh, the, the amino acids to be very effective. Uh, we even did this looking at the uh, uh, with response to uh, insulin. We thought, well, maybe it's not just amino acids. Maybe we should give insulin at the same time. Uh, I won't go through all the details of these experiments. These are cell culture studies, but I think you can see in the growth-restricted group versus the control group, the blue bars, there's really no change in response to insulin from cells that were part of a growth-restricted fetus. So there's no evidence that amino acids stimulate those pathways. There's no evidence that insulin will stimulate those pathways. But we did see some exciting observations that maybe the growth pathway, not the insulin-stimulated pathway that, puts, uh, that synthesizes proteins from amino acids, but maybe the growth pathway that allows for cell division to take place, more replication of cells so you could get hyperplasia to develop, might be sensitive in the IUGR group, the growth-restricted group, so that we might, might actually be able to use amino acids and insulin to promote cell division even after growth restriction has been around for quite a while. Um, so these are experimental studies to show what we're trying to do. But in terms of what we deal with in babies, um, we have a different issue. If you take uh, energy away in a fetus, a newborn baby or you and me, we oxidize amino acids to maintain our oxygen consumption rates. If you keep that going for a long time, a low energy supply for a long time, you return the oxidation of amino acids back to normal values. And what you're doing is you're channeling the amino acids not into immediate oxidation to maintain energy supply, you're now channeling them, uh, you're now just simply saying we don't have enough and you slow your rate of growth. So you substitute a slower rate of growth 
for a reduction in the supply of energy and you channel the, whatever amino acids are available into maintaining that limited growth rate. So if you adapt to this over time, I think you can understand what I've tried to show you experimentally. You, you come up with uh, exactly what we see clinically. Here's the normal preterm baby. This baby was born uh, for an incompetent cervix, so there was nothing wrong with the capacity for this baby to grow. It was just born early. And when finally provided enough nourishment, that's the caloric and protein intakes, that baby started to grow and followed the growth curve appropriate for that uh, particular gestational age. This is the baby that was already severely growth restricted at uh, that very early gestational age. And when fed the same amount of nourishment, that growth rate did not go up. Now, this was one of our smallest babies, a 435-gram baby born at 29 weeks gestation, severely growth restricted already but the kind of growth restriction that we don't, try to, we don't want to produce in the newborn nursery. That particular growth rate uh, kept this uh, child very small. Uh, she's now a teenager, and she's four foot eight inches tall. She's otherwise actually really quite healthy. Um, can we give too much protein? I'm suggesting that maybe some of these growth restricted babies, once they're adapted, might not do so well if we try to give them more protein Whereas for the normal preterm baby, giving more protein is maybe good for their growth rates. Well, lots of studies have shown that there are adverse effects. This is a study of high protein diets um, in uh, uh, Scotland. Um, when the group, got high, the, the group that got the high protein and low carbohydrate diet uh, produced infants um, who as adults now in their late 30s, actually from when this study was published, they're almost in their 40s, this group of, of infants now has, have, have complications that Dr. New already presented to you, the metabolic syndrome. Their blood pressures are high, their fasting glucose concentrations are high, indicating glucose intolerance and probably diabetes. Their plasma cortisols are high, and they have an increased uh, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis activity, and they're all obese. So too much of a good thing is not always better, especially if you can't use it. Very old studies using unusual formulations compared to today, very high in casein uh, in the uh, preterm formulas, show very obvious uh, complications. In the very small group of uh, small babies, the number with a low IQ was much higher in the group fed the very high protein uh, diets. But notice that high protein diet, none of us is, is giving anywhere close to that. What we're recommending is a gestational age specific increase in uh, what we're trying to provide. Remember, at this gestational age, you need this amount of protein to grow. At less older gestational ages, you need much less. Can you get better growth at any of the amino acid doses that I'm talking about by simply giving more energy? And this is a common misconception that you do need a certain amount of energy to process protein into growth but more energy, just like more protein, is not necessarily going to make things work out better. This cartoon shows you that at low energy intakes, more energy produces better protein balance. But at high energy intakes, there's no change in protein balance. The only thing that's increasing protein balance is your protein intake. So to grow, you need protein. At low energy intakes, you probably are not going to process that protein into protein balance. But at high energy intakes, more protein is the only thing that will continue to improve uh, protein balance. This particular study, I think, is really the best to show you exactly what happens. A little complicated. The bar on the left are those infants that were fed a routine amount of energy and protein. And this is their weight, their length, and their head circumference and their tricep skin fold thickness representing perhaps the amount of body fat that they have. And here we have in the middle bar, the open bar, babies that were fed more protein. Same energy, but more protein. Their weight went up, their length went up, their head circumference went up, no change in their body fat as you would expect. Protein is a very poor supply of, of producing fat. But now we're going to take that high protein group and give it a lot more energy. Well, the weight went up. So they're doing better, right? They're growing better. Not true. 
their length didn't improve, their head circumference didn't change at all, no more neurons, but their body fat content increased dramatically. Very obvious case that what's going on is that at higher energy intakes, more protein produces better growth, particularly of the length and head circumference. More energy at that particular point only makes you fatter, and that's true for babies. It's true for people after birth, too. But this is the uh, rate of weight gain, and that's the birth weight. So at any birth weight, the higher weight gain, that's the highest over there, produces the fattest of older children. The higher, the, that's the fattest newborn, and that's the one that got also the, fat, the largest increase in weight. So if we continue to overfeed babies, we have the propensity to produce obese children and in ch obese children produce obese adults. This is a, a phenomenon, uh, I think, that largely <laughs> reflects our society. We have been overfeeding our societies all over the world with sugar. Dr. New already pointed out the dramatic increase in obesity worldwide. And you can link it directly over a long period from the early 1700s all the way up to present with the degree of sugar intake. Surprising, hmm? So, summary. Oxygen deficit leads to uh, fetal growth failure. We still don't know what PO2, blood O2 saturation, and blood oxygen content we should keep for babies. But clearly, extremely low oxygen contents in babies limit growth. Glucose supply, well, we'd like to see that the baby has available for use about six to eight milligrams per kilo per minute. And I'll talk more about the problem if we try to give that much ourselves with, that uh, develops, and that's hyperglycemia. So we would like to ensure this good glucose utilization rate, uh, but we don't uh, quite uh, know how to do that without producing hyperglycemia. And glucose concentrations, I've, I think I've made a good point for keeping them somewhere above 50, or around 50 milligrams per deciliter, certainly not lower than that. Amino acids, well, if you're starting out at 24 to 30 weeks gestation, you're going to need around four grams per kilo per day. Um, I will point out in another talk that that starts at birth because birth doesn't, shouldn't stop growth. So this really should be something that we should uh, take care of immediately. And amino acids are important for growth. There are certain unique amino acids that I'll talk about again. Same for growth of adipose tissue. It looks like it's a normal human phenomenon in fetal development. We don't know why it's there, um, but we do know that there are unique mixes of special fatty acids we should pay more attention to because those are important for neuronal development, and it's very likely that this will start paying off with improved uh, behavioral outcomes and uh, uh, intellectual outcomes later in life. Insulin concentrations that result from normal nutrition are appropriate, but more insulin will lead to complications and won't make you better, won't help you grow better. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking with you.